My name is David Ewan, and I head up the Bravehearted Ministry at the Resurrection Center with Pastors Jose and Millie Martinez. Check us out at resurrectionspringfield.org. Like us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at TRC413. Subscribe to our YouTube channel, Res Sent Spring, and hear us on radio at resurrectioncenterradio.com. You've seen the posters and the announcements of our First Fruit Celebration, and that day is coming up soon. This year, we celebrate on Sunday, October 25th, so let's get ready. The only way you can be ready is if you know what First Fruits is. If I don't tell you about tithes and offerings first, then First Fruits won't make any sense. So that's what I'm going to do. We'll talk about tithes and offerings first. Next, we'll talk about First Fruits. Finally, you'll get an expert. You'll be an expert in all three. Today, we discussed the theology of first fruits. That is the academic understanding of first fruits. Next week, we talk about the divinity of first fruits. That's the spiritual understanding of first fruits. Here's a story of when I was a small boy with one of my brothers. My brother and I in a sandbox with our toy dumb trucks. That's how we played. He had a blue one, and I had a red one. Both were the same, other than the color. We could exchange, but he kept blue and I kept red, because that's what we owned. Mine is mine and his is his. Who owned the trucks and where did they come from? Well, it was a Christmas gift given out of love from our parents. On Christmas Day, my mother was sitting next to me and I said, where's my truck? She said, and said, here it is. And she put her hand on it. Here's the funny thing. I didn't know why I said that. I don't even know that I was getting a truck for Christmas. It was assumed for me the truck was mine. It didn't matter who or where it came from. See, it's like what we do now. We convert love into assumed ownership. It's mine, that kind of thinking. A selfish conditioning of the mind is developed when we are young. It's natural as it's part of our self-defense survival mechanism. The root source of this mechanism is good, as mankind is to survive. God gives us love by blessings, and we assume we own it through our selfish desires. Here's an illustration. I do two things at Harvard University. First, my team and I are creating a state holiday working with the governor's office for the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. It's something we're doing at, uh, with Harvard University. Second, I'm taking a course of study in theology for divinity at Harvard University. I'll graduate in early December. That's a fun secret. I haven't told anyone. The old me would say, I worked hard and paid for it, and my hard work positioned me to work with the governor's office in Harvard University. See, that's a prideful attitude. The new me recognizes that God gave me an opportunity. See that? The word opportunity. God gave me an opportunity for an even greater blessings in the future. I owe God gratitude for opportunity. Okay, so I owe God gratitude. How do I pay it? It's done through character and integrity. Say character and integrity. The Bible teaches us biblical principles specific to character and integrity. Again, character and integrity. Well, we're about to talk about tithing and offering. Character relates to the offering. That's the behavior towards giving. Integrity is the tithing. That's the obedience to instruction. More will be explained soon. Tithes and offerings are different. They're not the same. There's also an order, and that we'll talk about later too. Tithes is number one. It is given first. Offerings is number two. It is given after. So tithes comes before offering. Offering comes after tithes. That's in order. It's a biblical principle. Now let's start simple. Let's begin with tithes. A tithe is a specific amount. It's 10% of your income, not your gross income, not before taxes. It's after taxes. It's your net income. It's the actual harvest, if you will, the money that you receive. Okay, so a tithe is the specific amount, it's 10% of your income, that you give first. And an offering is anything extra that you give beyond that. In Deuteronomy 14.22, 
the scripture says, be sure to set aside a tenth of all that your fields produce each year. Well, in the years of an agricultural economy thousands of years ago, that's why we're talking about a tenth of that all your fields produce each year. Well, in modern times, it's not fields, it's yields. That means the income you bring in. So Deuteronomy 14.22, in today's speak, would be be sure to set aside a tenth of all that your yields, that means your income, produce each year. So this is a biblical principle that is different from an offering. Tithing is the first 10%, and an offering is what is after and beyond the 10%. It is not the same. An offering alone is not a biblical principle. An offering is a biblical principle, but an offering alone is not a biblical principle. Because an offering is what comes after the tithe. Without the tithe, there is no offering. Imagine a broken down car with a tow truck. The car is dead without the tow truck. An offering, in terms of biblical principle, is dead without the tithe. An offering alone is ignorance. It's that simple. Payment of the tithes is an obligation. Say obligation. We read in Malachi chapter 3, verse 8 through 10, where Christians are required to give 10% of their income to God through the church if faithfully adhered to the act is to attract a rich blessing from the Lord. This is also confirmed in Leviticus chapter 27, verse 30 through 34. So a lesson on tithes can be found in Malachi chapter 3, verse 8 through 10, and Leviticus chapter 27, 30 through 34. See, now you have a guide. We'll talk about Malachi a little bit later. So tithing is a form of obedience because it shows God that you trust him, not money. To provide. Again, tithing is an act of obedience. It, worship, on the other hand, is a ministry unto the Lord. You cannot minister to the Lord with your money. He doesn't need it. He needs your obedience. Tithing ensures that our needs will be met and gives back to God whatever was always his. God is honored when we are faithful. Let's talk about disobedience. Why not? It's what people do. No surprise there. If you don't pay tithe, then the Bible says you are robbing God and you are under a curse. Say curse. This curse cannot be removed by your good works or the fact that you are born again. You can only reverse this curse if you start paying the tithe. Tithe is the only key to prosperity and God's blessing. The book of Malachi teaches us that. So I'm going to go to Malachi chapter 3, verse 8 through 10. Again, this is Malachi chapter 3, verse 8 through 10. Will a mere mortal rob God? Yet you rob me. But you ask, how are, you, how are we robbing you? In tithes and offerings, you are under a curse. Your whole nation, because you are robbing me. Bring the whole tithes on into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Test me on this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. See, this is exactly what we've been talking about. Let's talk about what an offering is. Okay, An offering can be better understood by looking at 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 7. And I read, each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. See, tithing is the first 10%, and an offering is what is after and beyond the 10%. It's not the same. Remember, now Deuteronomy in chapter 14, verse 22 says, be sure to set aside a tenth of all that your fields produce each year. So Deuteronomy chapter 14, verse 22 gives the instruction for tithes, and 2 of Corinthians chapter 9, verse 7 talks about the offering. And remember what we learned that 
Ties explained, uh, well, I should say, and remember what we learned, that tithes is explained more in Malachi chapter 3, verse 8 through 10, and Leviticus chapter 7, verse 30 through 34. We talked about those. Now let's talk about the character and integrity that I referred to before. A tithe, as we said before, is a specific amount. It's 10% of your income that you give first. An offering is anything extra that you give beyond that. So character comes from your offering. It's what is in your heart. Integrity comes from your tithing. You are entrusted with principles to follow. It's what determines your trustworthiness. Okay, so here's a review of tithing and offering. A character relates to offering. Your integrity relates to tithing. So an offering reflects your character. Obedience to tithing shows your true integrity. And character, again, is shown in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 7. That's the offering. And integrity is talked about in Deuteronomy chapter 14, verse 22. That's the tithe. So become a tithing expert by looking at Malachi chapter 3, verse 8 through 10. Leviticus chapter 27, verse 30 through 34. Now keep in mind the charitable donations are tax deductible and the IRS considers church tithing to be tax deductible as well. To deduct the amount you tithe to your church or place a worship report, the amount you donate to qualify charitable organizations such as churches on Schedule A, and that's the itemized deductions. Uh, the cash, uh, we, uh, we save all the envelopes, so take a picture of what you write on the envelope. There's your receipt. A check, well, that's your receipt you get from online banking. And for credit card processing, we text it to you. And uh, so now we know about tithing and offerings. Now we can talk about the first fruits. Okay, we are ready now. So what is first fruits in the Bible? So here's how the, the, the history goes. The book of Exodus narrates how Moses led the Israelites in building the tabernacle. That's in Exodus chapter 35, verse 40, and it comes with God's instructions, and that's in uh, Exodus chapter 25, verse 31. Then in the book of Leviticus, we talked about Leviticus before, God tells the Israelites and their priests how to make offerings in the tabernacle and how to conduct themselves while camped around the Holy Tent Sanctuary. The book of Exodus talks about the people. The book of Leviticus talks about the instructions. See how that works? The book of Leviticus is the third book of the Old Testament. It contains a record of God's installing a priesthood for his nation and giving them a biblical set of principles that would enable them to maintain holiness in his eyes. Now I'm going to read Leviticus chapter 23 verse 10, but before I do that, I need to tell you what a sheaf is. This is what a sheaf is. A sheaf is a bundle of grain stalks laid lengthwise and tied together after reaping, after gathering together from a harvest. Okay, so that's what a sheaf is. Uh, so let's read Leviticus chapter 23, verse 10. When you come into the land which I give you and reap its harvest, then you shall bring a sheaf of the first fruits of the harvest to the priests. And that's in Leviticus chapter 23, verse 10. So did you hear me say first fruits? So that's what it's mentioned in that. Okay? The concept of first fruits is rooted in biblical times when people lived in an agricultural society. Harvest time was significant because that was when the hard work the farmers had poured into the crops all year began to pay off. They were literally reaping what they sowed. That's the phrase, you reap what you sow. God called his people to bring the first yield the first early portion of the harvest, the first fruits. This was to demonstrate uh, the Israelites the obedience, trust, and reverence for God. Back then, there were plenty of rules associated with making first fruit sacrifices. They had to be brought to the temple priest. No other crops could be harvested until after the first fruits were presented. It was a complex process, and that is why it became ceremonial. Okay, now the Hebrew word for first fruit is bikaram. 
literally translated to promise to come. See, that's very prophetic. The Israelites saw these first fruits as an investment into their future. God told them that if they brought their first fruits to him, he would bless all that came afterwards. First fruits is a prophetic offering. So we talked uh, about how tithes relates to integrity. That's the trust and obedience. We also talked about offering relates to character. That's the behavior. Now you know first fruits is a prophetic offering. That's how the three are different. Okay, so let's talk about first fruits in the Bible. Um, in Proverbs 3 9, the scripture says, Honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops. That's in Proverbs. We see the term first fruits initially mentioned in the book of Exodus when Moses is leading God's people out of captivity in Egypt. God instructed the Israelites to give up their first of their crops so that they could understand the value, say the word value, the value of God's blessings. Through the first five books of the Bible, Moses brings up the idea of a total of 13 times. That's because it was an essential concept for his people to understand. First fruits is mentioned throughout the Old Testament, and it's even referenced in the New Testament books. In the New Testament, the, first, uh, the term first fruit takes on a symbolic meaning. The Apostle Paul wrote to demand higher ethical and moral standards. He also used a metaphor for first fruits. He was writing to the church of Corinth, an in, in ancient city in Greece. It's, about, it's in south central Greece. The remains of the ancient city lie about 50 miles west of Athens. So that's where Corinth was. So 1st of Corinthians, chapter 15, verse 20 through 22. Again, it's 1st of Corinthians, chapter 15, verse 20 through 22. And the scripture reads, But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. So you see, Jesus was God's first fruits, his one and only son, and the best that humanity had to offer. God gave Jesus, who was raised from the dead, up for us, in the same way that we sacrifice the best we have for him. We no longer live in an agricultural-based society. You likely don't worry about harvest time or giving away the first yield of your crops. But the idea of first fruits is still relevant. It just takes on a new meaning for us. Our first fruits has moved from an agricultural to a modern-day harvest, the financial harvest. Today, you sow your seeds to reap a financial harvest in your bank account. That is the farm that you manage. Now here's uh, the difference between first fruits and tithing. Ezekiel's ministry was conducted in Jerusalem and Babylon in the first three decades of the sixth century. He held that each man is responsible for his own acts. As a prophet, he focused on responsibility as it relates to the future. See that? As a prophet, he focused on the responsibility as it relates to the future. Be responsible for your acts today, and that will determine your future. Now, before the surrender, the first surrender, I should say, of Jerusalem, he was a functioning priest and prophet. He was among those deported to Babylonia. The town of Babylon was located along the Euphrates River in present-day Iraq. So that's where that was. In Ezekiel chapter 44, verse 30, Ezekiel chapter 44, verse 30, the scripture reads, the first of all first, fr I, I should say, yes, the first of all first fruits of every kind and every contribution of every kind from all your contributions shall be for the priests. You shall also give to the priests the first of your dough to cause a blessing to the rest on your house. See, the first fruit offerings are typically an annual gift to the church done at harvest time. Now, because we're not actually harvesting crops, the harvest can mean different things to different people. Perhaps you just got a bonus at work. Maybe you just received a huge tax refund check. Maybe you saved 15% or more in car insurance by switching to Geico. Um, 
These are all harvest time moments when your hard work pays off. There are also great opportunities to turn back to God in gratitude for the blessings. You have to know your blessings. I talked about the experience at Harvard University. That blessing has yet to be realized, but you see I'm planting the seeds on the farm. Now, whenever you decide to make a first fruit offering, the important thing is that you do it freely with no guilt or obligation. This is supposed to be a celebration of all that God has done for you. It's a kind of worship. It's a kind of worship that you can use to support the work of others. A first fruit offering is our opportunity to give above and beyond just a regular tithe. Now, why is giving first fruits important? Making a first fruit offering opens us up to allow God to work in our lives. When we approach God with open hands rather than with clenched fists, it makes it easier for God to give us more to work with. Now, giving our first fruits reminds us that God is our ultimate priority. It shows God that we are obedient to him and we can be trusted with more. Perhaps the most important, being generous in this way, shows us that we are grateful for all God has given us. First fruits are an offering to God of the increase in income that we receive. Notice we're talking about the increase in income and not an overall amount. Specifically, first fruits is the first portion of that increase. Okay? The fruits are your blessings from God. That is the harvest. First fruits is the first portion of that harvest. What you give to God acknowledges that what you have is from God. That is why we give our first fruits. Okay? The motivation of first fruits is a free will offering that we offer out of generosity. It shows that we are not in love with money and we are grateful to God as the ultimate source of the increase. That means the blessings. Offering first fruits when we receive an increase is a demonstration of our faith in God as the true source of our provision. Remember, when we consider what faith is, we need to acknowledge that faith is an action word. Now, James said that unless faith produces action, it really isn't faith at all. In James chapter 2, verse 17, the scripture reads, In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. So the first fruit offering is one way to activate our faith in God as our provider. Now, first fruits is giving us an expression of gratitude, dedication, and trust. So the gratitude is the acknowledgement that everything comes from God. The dedication is declaring this and everything that follows belongs to God. And the trust, expressing faith in God's continued provision. Okay, so how do, how do we give the first fruits offer? Well, in Romans 11.16, we learn about that. Romans chapter 11, verse 16. If the part of the dough offered as first fruits is holy, then the whole batch is holy. If the root is holy, so are the branches. And that's in Romans eleven sixteen. So what does this practically look like? How do you determine how, when, and how much you should give as a first fruit offering? This is going to look different for every person in each uh, season. The process of giving above your normal tithe can help prepare you for God to make uh, for God to make a difference in your life. Making a first fruit offering demonstrates obedience to God rather than your money. First fruits are a tangible offering. It's a concept that is honorable and holy to God. By offering the first portion of our increase, that means the blessing to God, as a first fruit offering, we move the entire increase out of the world's curse system and into the kingdom of God for as long as it continues. In the spiritual realm, once we make a portion of the increase uh, holy by offering it to God, we have, in fact, made an entire increase holy. Now, let's talk about God's promise for the first fruits. Not only does the first fruits offering move the entire increase that we receive into the blessings of the kingdom of God and out of the world's cursed system, but it also comes with an important promise. 
And that's in Proverbs chapter 3, verse 9 through 10. Again, Proverbs chapter 3, verse 9 through 10. Honor the Lord with all your possessions and with the first fruits of all your increase. So your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. Well, obviously that promise was written in an agricultural society. I don't know about you, but I don't have any barns or a wine press to overflow with new wine. So what do these verses mean to us today? Centuries ago, barns were the storage area for people to save up provision. For most of us today, the place where we store up provision is in our bank accounts. So that means the first fruit offering will help ensure our bank accounts are always filled with plenty of provision. When you think about it, those promises make sense. Our first fruit offerings demonstrate that we can be trusted with money because we don't love it. Proverbs says that we are honoring God with our first fruits. Therefore, since we can be trusted to be good stewards over our finances, God can keep income flowing to us knowing it will be handled responsibly. Today, we talked about the theology. That's the academic understanding of first fruits. Next week, we'll talk about the divinity. That will be the spiritual understanding of first fruits. We learned about tithing and offering and how it relates to character and integrity. Once we got that out of the way, we talked about first fruits by giving history to it and applied the meaning with today's understanding. My name is David Ewan, and this is the Resurrection Center.